precisely. It's another Tuesday, so another 60 minutes of nuggets of wisdom under the brand of Disruption Talks. So the topic for today is future of embedded payments, question how to build a customer-centric product in the digital economy. And in this episode, we will have the utmost pleasure of hosting a seasoned product leader, expert in all things payments, passionate about product management, with over 15 years of experience in both startups and large global companies, uh, Yael Barak, a VP of product management at checkout.com. And my show notes say the $50 billion startup, but I don't think when the word billion happens, there's no longer startup in play. It's at least a scale, right? It's at least a scale. <laughs> Hi, Philip. Nice to be here. It is a scale up, but uh, I think for us, our, our founder, Guillaume, likes to say we're still at chapter zero because that's our mindset, because we still feel like there's a whole lot of runway ahead of us. So uh, we are scaling up, but uh, we feel like there's still a lot of room for growth. And with that optimism, let's continue the interview. So let's hear a little bit more about Yael, before we hear about checkout and before we talk about the industry, who is Yael? How did she become the VP of product management at checkout.com? The basics, please. Sure. Well, I think I actually had a, a quite a roundabout way of, of getting to where I am today. I didn't grow up wanting to be a product manager. I don't think that, that it was a thing growing up, uh, but uh, I definitely always had an interest in technology um and and you know in in the 80s i i had i my parents gave me a commodore 64 and i and i was doing some basic very you know rudimentary basic programming so even though as i you know grew up and and went to university technology or or engineering software engineering was not at all the direction i took uh it was always in the back of my mind and i think what uh every product manager has that probably i always had as well was uh uh, really um, a need to understand the world around me, a need to solve problems, a need for things to make sense, um, and, and a curiosity of the world. And so those, those traits uh, carry very naturally into product management. And when I started working with uh, software developers and customers and marketing, everything just came together. Um, and I, I happen to have found myself in this uh, fintech space, in the payment space, uh, starting from the merchant side. I was working in a, a software business that was accepting digital payments, and I was a product manager there embedding the payments into our uh, software platform, and that gave me a peek into what it's like to embed payments for global solutions. We were selling all around the world. Uh, every country is different. Every uh, consumers in different countries want to pay different ways, um, and so that that kind of got me curious about payments. And here we are today, and uh, been been doing this for a long time now. So you mentioned curiosity, problem solving, uh, the recipe for success slash disaster, depending on the situation. <laughs> do you like the pressure as well? Do you like the pressure, or do you like to have? no time to solve everything because many people who like problems problem solving they also like you know like the walls are closing in uh, mm. i gotta solve this i think it takes all kinds i personally enjoy the pressure i also enjoy the ambiguity of a good problem of having many solutions ahead of me and working my way towards the best uh solution for the time and for the circumstances uh but I do think it takes all kinds. Uh, you know, for me, the pressure drives focus. Uh, lack of time, lack of resource means you have to make uh, choices, and making the right choice is what makes a good product manager. Solid, solid quote for later. So you mentioned those couple of things. Um, I'm curious, after those 15 years plus in business, in product management specifically, what makes you get up in the morning? Uh, those those things that you mentioned curiosity problem solving the ambiguity of it all and hopefully the urgency that produces scar scarcity which further produces uh, the need for creativity and decision right uh, what else if anything for me personally uh i like a good mission so you know at checkout we say that our mission is to enable our customers and their customers to participate in the digital economy and what that means is 
if we serve marketplaces, for example, like, uh, you know, Etsy, Uber, Amazon, these are marketplaces where they are enabling other businesses to participate, to sell, to, to engage with consumers, we feel that we have a part to play in that. And that's everything that we do, we look through that lens. Are we actually driving that agenda forward? So for me, that's what gets me up in the morning. That's my mission. How is what I'm doing connecting to that particular um, objective or that particular mission that Checkout had set up for itself? Um, and it's it's a lens that all of us at Checkout look through. Um, and, and again, it, for me, it helps me focus, helps me measure how have I have how is what I'm doing moving that lever moving that mission? So assume you're speaking to someone even less technical than me, not that difficult to find. How do you explain mm -hmm. what Checkout.com does for a living to someone outside of the industry? What mm -hmm. is the problem that once we sprinkle some of that special uh, powder from Checkout.com, the problem just becomes solved? I think at, at its most basic, checkout connects consumers and businesses and allows them to transact, whether it's online businesses who are taking payments online from their customers. Sometimes it's businesses who disperse payments. Think about uh, payroll, for example, or insurance payments. Uh, digital payments are not just about collecting payments from someone. They're also about moving money, about people sending money across borders to their families, for example, in other countries. Um, and so at the most basic, that is what Checkout does. We connect businesses and their customers through a, a, a technology platform. If we're going to go you know, deeper into the detail, then I would say we do this in many countries around the world, which, um, which it adds a, a, you know, an, an aspect of complexity, uh, both from a technology point of view, because you have to access payment systems around the world. You have to enable different payment methods that people want to use around the world. You also have to be able to work in different regulatory environments around the world. Uh, the law, you know, the, the way you can uh, transact financially in America is not the same as in Europe or in Asia or in the Middle East. And Checkout operates in uh, 11 different markets around the world. So, you know, it, it's uh, the ability to do that um, in, within one technology platform and make that accessible to our business customers who themselves have requirements to do that around the world, that is, uh, that that would be my, my second level, you know, explanation of what Checkout does. And both are equally necessary. So, uh, Absolutely. The, gotta, gotta ask this question, a, a day of a VP of product management at Checkout.com, does it look like anything? Because do those days replicate or is mm -hmm. every day a completely different one? So uh, I would say there are probably repeating themes, though no day, definitely no day ever looks like a different, like the other day. Uh, but there are def there are activities that that are the repeating themes of any product manager, regardless of the most junior or all the way up to the chief product officer, because at our core, what we do all day long is think about our customers. Um, my customers specifically check out our businesses, but I need to think about their customers as well, who might be consumers or even other businesses. So all day long, everything that I do, uh, I think about the problems that I'm solving for my customers. And sometimes I'm doing it very tactically. I might be meeting with my software engineers, or I might be meeting with the commercial team who's out there selling, or with even business operations team, like, uh, you know, support or customer service who actually, um, interact with our customers every day. And from all these interactions, I'm understanding, uh, first of all, if what I'm doing is moving the needle for our customers, if what I'm doing is uh, scalable for the business, for our business as well. Um, and so on any given day, I might either be meeting with internal teams, meeting with commercial teams, meeting with our customers, meeting with our um, ecosystems of, of other companies that we work with, financial services partners. Uh, sometimes it's regulatory, you know, uh, um, advisors. And, uh, but the common theme throughout is uh, thinking about our customers, the problem we want to solve for them, the value we want to drive for them, and how that translates and lays out over time in the roadmap. So 
when you say solving problems for your customers, there's the, uh, let's say, customers tell you what their problems are approach or the Steve Jobs of I will solve the problems for my customers prior to them even having an idea that this will be a problem for them. So I'm not going to ask you uh, either or because I'm pretty sure it's some shade of gray between the white and the black, but the white and the black being respectively more of a 12 to 18 month approach or more of a, you know, the, the overarching uh, future proof payment solutions being built kind of approach because sometimes you definitely find yourself in a position where the train is going full speed ahead and you're trying to put the tracks just in front of that due to the nature of sometimes problems arising from the customers but at the same time you have to balance it out with okay uh we're not just going to be reactive we have to be proactive and drive the paradigm right so I think uh, it's all of the above. Uh, first of all, to start with, you know, customer telling me they have a problem. You, you're right that a customer might come in with a statement that is very tactical. Like, you know, I want to be able to pay someone in Malaysia, make that happen for me. You know, that's a tactical thing. Uh, and I listen to that. Um, but a good product manager will also try to understand why. Why is it that you, I mean, that might be, well, I have lots of customers in Malaysia and I need to make, right? But it could also be more nuanced. It could also uh, be that um, that business has an entity in Malaysia and they just want to transfer money between different entities. So the, 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 I think uh, the most important thing for a product manager is to listen for not just the actual uh, need that's like the, the, the actual requirement being expressed by a customer or a commercial team or a business partner but also understand what's behind it link that up with all kinds of other requests and questions that you're getting from either other customers other you know parts of the business the competitive landscape look at what your competitors are doing as well and from that derive that overarching story and maybe for one example we can talk about um you know the, the big theme right now for everyone is um the the dichotomy or the the transition, the, the coming together of Web 2 and Web 3, you know, fiat financial services, traditional banking rails with crypto and stable coin. And that that whole um, those two worlds are starting to come together. And the questions that we ask ourselves are, what are the problems today that we can help solve? But also, what do we think is going to happen in the future? How can we set up for a future in which there is little difference between whether you're transacting with a, a bank or, or a crypto uh, exchange, whether you are holding fiat currency or, or crypto or stable coin, right? Today, they're very siloed from each other. But as we as we look at the the what's happening in the market, what's happening in different countries around the world, we can also start thinking about, well, what's a future what does the future look like what it might look like and maybe my final comment is about the you know uh, laying the tracks ahead of the train i think that's pretty much a reality for us right now at this the speed at which technology is progressing i i, I don't know anyone that makes five-year plans anymore or at least when you make a five-year plan you you're very much conceding that the, the the cone of uncertainty is so big at the end of those five years I, I think in my experience, I have not had in, in the last couple of years, our great example with the pandemic, totally appended all roadmaps, all plans. Uh, you know, you ha we had to pivot quick. Everyone in the world had to pivot their businesses very quickly to a new reality. And that one was not technology driven. That one was, you know, uh, world events. So I think the pace at which we move has quickened, um, therefore, we better get used to laying the tracks ahead of the train. Uh, I, I really like how you how you responded to that. So essentially, both and the why of the both in the consequence of uh, I respond to what I have to respond, but I also draw conclusions from those in instances becoming a pattern. And essentially, if I hear the same thing from 17 clients, you might just be onto something that might need a, a product, not a custom response, right? So exactly. Uh, yeah. so, so definitely that. 
Uh, you did mention how in uh, in the response to the question, um, considering uh, um, how does your day at work look like and if there's a, ever a day that's like the other, you mentioned that you have to have discussions with engineers. I want to add some more stakeholders into the mix and throw a difficult question. Let's put in compliance so the legal team gets in on board, operations, uh, risk management. So once again, the legal team how do you make it all work together? How do you align the interdimensional approach? Because you can't buy a single dimensional solution. That would only make it worse. So how do you make it work with so many stakeholders? Right. It's the tracks needing to be laid at the same time. Yeah. So the, my approach to working with different stakeholders is just like I work with my clients or customers, understanding their perspective and having empathy for their need. So when you're working with a compliance officer, their job is to protect the company from regulatory risk, make sure that you know we are keeping up with the laws in the countries in which we operate so that we are not exposed to any risk that would stop business, right? Or when you're working with someone in customer support, their job is to improve our customers' experience by quickly responding to needs, by having access to the tools that they need in order to support our customers. So understanding that um, helps me think about how all of these things connect to a customer experience that I'm trying to build and ultimately impact that customer experience. If we are uh, not able to set up our support team for success, then the customer is, is suffering. If we are, as a business, uh, unable to transact in a certain jurisdiction because the regulator has put some limitations on us, it impacts our ability to go to market for our customer. So keeping that in mind, um, first of all, helps me and, and my team think about our product and service holistically. And then the tension between, uh, you know, different um, sometimes requirements, you know, again, if, if I'm the compliance or risk, um, you know, uh, um, manager of, of a certain team, then my maybe my perspective is I want to put the most amount of limitation to control the risk, right? Which sometimes create again a product experience which isn't as smooth or as as um, efficient for the customer. So my job as a product manager is to reflect all of that back to the entire team and say things like, if we set this up this way then we are impacting the customer experience that way. And so we are actually inhibiting our ability to do business. We're inhibiting our own product. And obviously that's something that um, as, a, as, a, as a team at, at you know, checkout or any business, we are committed to our business. We're committed to our customer and to moving that forward. So there's definitely a lot of negotiation involved um, and a lot of uh, listening and understanding how to, work around different requirements and come up with the best, most pragmatic solution. I, I suppose this is a, like a single person in, in this case, but in terms of any business, it's uh, many more operation uh, of uh, basically trying to do user research, but not on users, but much rather the stakeholders, because just like you mentioned, everybody's got their own job to do, and they're not doing that just because they love the complexity to create, but much rather they want to make sure that at the end of the day, they've yeah. done what they've been hired to do. So uh, just like what you mentioned with uh, asking the questions uh, by your customers and trying to get in what's beneath the, the why of the action, the why of the ask, because that helps you further align the team and get them going in this, uh, you know, we're shooting for the same goal kind of mentality. That, that's, exactly. that's what I'm hearing. Yeah. So about checkout let's go uh, you just announced an exciting project a rollout of the new feature that allows businesses to accept and make payments in usd coin a popular stable coin that's pegged to the us dollar what are your expectations towards entering crypto uh and let's just let's just pretend that the news have not been on today <laughs> yeah yeah and actually you know it's it's a it's it's a good moment in time to reflect about uh, about the, uh, the the there's a what's happening momentarily, and as we said before, there's what's the longer term 
um, you know, trend or the longer term direction in which uh, I think our financial systems are going. The, so just to maybe address the, you know, the, 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 the tension between what's happening in, in the value of crypto assets versus the technology of distributed networks or, or ledgers, the, the need for um, a more, more efficient financial rails to move money, the need is there. And the technology is going to go there. And whether, where there is a need, there's going to be a product and there's eventually going to be market fit. So, you know, every now and again, we're going to see uh, some sort of uh, conflation and, 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 and maybe uh, companies who aren't um, as uh, well set up or the foundation isn't as strong, they're, they're going to suffer. But the, the, the companies and the products that answer a true need and are set up in the right way, they're going to... Uh, they're, they're going to flourish and they're going to create that uh, additional uh, momentum. And so, you know, for us, what we're what we've announced uh, a couple of weeks ago and what we're doing is is a natural progression in supporting our customers. And I'll explain that um, our customers, whether they are uh, uh, crypto natives, so whether they are, let's say, uh, merchants who accept crypto, or maybe they're not, maybe they still accept only fiat currency, one of the major needs that they have is liquidity. Uh, and basically, that means if I'm, uh, if I'm a business and I accepted payments, uh, you know, uh, on Friday, right now to, to accept these, these payments settled in my bank account, if I'm going through the traditional banking rails, it'll happen on Monday, because the banking system doesn't work on the weekend, right? However, the Web3 system, the Web3 rails are 24-7, 365 and real time. So if I get uh, a crypto deposit, I get a crypto deposit immediately in my bank account, in my uh, crypto wallet. So what we're doing, uh, what we announced with our stablecoin settlement is we're allowing merchants or businesses who accept fiat currencies, accept US dollar, for example, to in real time withdraw that US dollar into you into USDC, which is a crypto stablecoin, right? So it gives them immediate liquidity, which for some businesses is critical, especially in those you know banking uh, off days. That is the value that we're driving with with what we've announced. That there's a whole other ecosystem of accepting crypto and getting settled in crypto, you know, which we may or may not go to in the future, but what we're thinking about with, with what we've announced a couple of weeks ago is how do we drive value for all merchants, whether or not they're crypto native merchants, uh, and help them solve a problem of liquidity and, and fast settlement. And so that's the uh, um, that's that's the gist of it. No, well, it's a, it's a equally diplomatic as. Uh precise and avoiding way of answering a question that given everything that we've outlined it is not an easy question to tackle overall any question concerning uh this this type of asset so um you uh so, so essentially this feature makes checkout.com something like uh automated clearing house in some sense would would, would you call it's it that? definitely a clearing house activity and and uh yeah, maybe, maybe uh, you know, just to make sure you don't think I'm trying to avoid any answers here. Um, no, 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 no. <laughs> no. But please do. I'm shutting up. Um, so, uh, you know, there's, like I said, enabling uh, the trading of crypto asset, of, of crypto coins, like, you know, buying and selling, you know, uh, this is something we're not doing yet. We may do in the future, but it, it's not a role we, we are playing just yet. Um, and uh, the enabling of the clearing, as you say, that's where we felt was the most value for us to provide right now. And also, not just because of technology, not just because we can connect those you know, fiat rails with the crypto rails, but because we feel like we're best set up to control the risk of it. And maybe that's, uh, that's another aspect that, that you're looking for is uh, when, when you... Um, Obviously, one one uh, one one major risk of crypto is that volatility. But by selecting, you know, uh, USDC, which is pegged to the dollar, so USDC is a stable, true stable coin, and has not, you know, lost any of its value. 
uh, compared to other stable coins recently. Um, we've taken decisions to protect both ourselves and the businesses that we work with. So choosing, you know, that we're not supporting any stable coin, we've chosen USDC, uh, but also um, so choosing that correctly, doing our own internal um, financial systems, risk putting controls in place uh, that protect both ourselves and our customer. That's all part of how this product is built to de-risk from the volatility of, of an asset like crypto. Like I said, I, I didn't mean anything underhanded with that comment, but I'm still glad yeah. that I heard the extended response because it was very valuable. So this is a global product. From a product manager perspective, how do you roll out something globally? We hear oftentimes that, for example, Google or Facebook, or Google has launched a specific version of Google Pay in India as mm -hmm. a soft launch place, or that Instagram is allowing people to have much more interaction with the messages and the direct messages element of Instagram. And after that validation happens, then they push it globally. I imagine it's wildly different where you have to roll it out to the entire globe all at once. What's that like? Absolutely. Uh, for us, because we're in financial services, which is regulated pretty much everywhere around the world, uh, every country that we go to is a totally different story from the point of view of uh, rolling out financial services. So uh, every time we roll out in a new market, the first question that we have to ask ourselves is what's the regulatory environment in that market? Uh, what are the laws? What's the, what, what, what do we have to do to uh, set ourselves up in the right way? How, how do we have to inform our customers even? Um, you know, and it seems maybe like, uh, for example, you know, working in North America versus working in Europe, North America, the US, uh, 50 states, but they operate as one, uh, pretty much one, let's call it reg regulatory environment. You go to Europe, you think it's one, you know, market, kind of one market, but still in different countries, you will find different, uh, different flavors of the same regulation. PSD2 is a good example. Um, and, and you have to adapt your, your product in different countries uh, to different rules. Also, uh, the market is different. Uh, and, and, and again, U.S. versus Europe, U.S., one, one currency, uh, pretty much single, you know, financial system where behavior of consumer is pretty much the same. You go to Europe and from, you know, Germany to France, people behave totally differently, con consumers. And so if you're going to roll out a product uh, that's about them making payments and them ha having access to their financial assets, they're going to feel differently about it in France than they do in Germany, than they do in the UK. And so you have to have all these things in mind um, as you adapt your product from one country to the next or from one market to the next um, so that uh, so that you can roll out, not, not just uh, roll out gradually from a commercial point of view, but roll out the right product to be successful in the market that you're rolling out in. And I want to go to our curious audience because there's a follow-up question that has landed there. That's mm -hmm. a perfect segue. Uh, it's a question from, and I hope I'm not butchering this. Please let me know in the comments from Jatin Narang. I'm pretty, I'm 50% I'm there. I'm thinking there were other people who said, I'm happy to have asked the first question today. No, no, no. This is the third question, but it's the most fitting here. So this is what we're going to start with. How does the product team measure success post-launch at checkout? Do commercial and product teams focus more on business metrics or on immediate customer metrics post-launch? So let's say we've already moved the needle on the timeline. We launched globally. And the question here makes more sense. Sure. So first of all, uh, we set up success metrics before we launch, right? So we, we set up uh, some hypotheses and we, and, and we say, this is how we're going to measure whether or not we've been successful. It could be around adoption. It could be around revenue. It could be around um, certain feature um, performance. So depending on what kind of uh, service you're rolling out, uh, the, the ahead of rolling out, we will set up for ourselves the measures of success. And then as we roll out, we'll start 
we'll start looking at the data that comes in. Um, well, definitely. So there's there's the qualitative data comes in, coming in from you know usage of your product. Then there's uh, sorry quantitative. Then there's qualitative. You talking to your customers, your businesses who have implemented uh, the product and understanding what their experience is. Does it actually um, it, it, is it in line with what your expectation was? Is it was it as easy to integrate as you thought it was going to be? Um, and sometimes you you actually get surprised. I'll give you one example. Um, at checkout, most of the products that we build uh, are API first products. So we build the API that would allow our our customers to integrate the service. We give the customers the API. However, for most of our services, there's also a um, let's call it hosted user interface. So you can log in to our uh, dashboard and you can use the same feature, but without being integrated with it. And in one of the products that I work on, we've always made the assumption that API first is what our customers would prefer because that's, that's what most of our customers really do. But we found uh, with one of the products that we released that in order to save themselves the integration time, many of the customers went to the dashboard first and they just started using the feature before they integrated the API. They didn't in the end integrate the API, but they actually wanted to save time on integration. So they went and started using the feature directly from the dashboard. That's a really interesting learning um, that we've since applied. And now we do our API and dashboard um, rollout at the same time so that uh, our customers can have that kind of uh, choice, whether they want to go directly into integration or they want to start using uh, via our interfaces, the same features. Jatin, and I know that's the correct pronunciation because he told me on direct message that it is. I hope <laughs> that's, uh, that's the answer you're looking for. If not, follow up in the comments, please. Um, in the meantime, I'd like us to go back to to our our talking points and uh, more on this on the on this crypto thing being the starting point of new exciting things. But I'm pretty sure there's more things that could be exciting if we if you could just give me like your 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 top three your greatest disappointment greatest surprise and most exciting mm. thing in the payments world yeah okay i'll start i'll start with the positives uh so i am very excited about the pace at which digital payments has moved in the last two three years and you know, because I'm an optimist, I have to say this is one good thing that COVID has done for us. You know, it, it forced a lot of innovation uh, in the sense that because people were, you know, at home, had to uh, find other ways of, of uh, getting services that they were used to going out of their house for, um, you know, it, it actually, uh, in, at least where I, I'm living in Canada and where I live, I saw a lot more businesses um, adapt the way that they were accepting payments and giving services, uh, not just to online, because yes, a lot of online was already there, but um, the ability to, uh, you know, things, but simple things like grocery shopping suddenly skipped two generations ahead uh, and, and, and services um, that brought things to you where you are. Um, those, those are, uh, I think, accelerated very quickly and the way it trans, uh, translated into payments is, first of all, um, it forced the payments companies to improve the way they do um, validation of, of the payee, the payer. So things like authentication, making sure that there's no fraud, um, making sure that uh, a payment is uh, processed as quickly as possible. That, that doesn't sound maybe uh, very exciting because it's kind of on the back end of payments. It doesn't change the interface that you're using. But for someone like me who lives on small improvements of you know approval rates of transactions and, um, and routing, efficient routing of transactions, those were things that it, in my world changed the lives of the businesses that we serve. Um, but specifically things that we are starting to see now, like um, tapping a card on a phone so basically uh, using someone's mobile phone as a point of sale device to accept payment from a customer by the customer tapping their card on the phone. Uh, 
that is those are solutions that I've known I've known were in development for a few years, but now we saw Apple uh, starting to release it, and we're going to see Samsung, I'm sure, follow up with their solution. So those are things that excite me. Um, things that still disappoint me <laughs> are uh, traditional financial um, uh, financial uh, institutions being a little slow to the party. So my own bank, where I, you know. My, my commercial bank where I keep my bank account, how quickly they are developing access, digital access for me uh, to not have to do things like come into the branch or go to an ATM. To me, again, with, with COVID, branches were closed, ATMs not in my house. And it was very frustrating uh, to think that all these access points are still relevant, that, you know, that, that I actually have to go into the branch to do something. I, I think the financial institutions are going to lose more and more share of mind of, of, of the uh, users if they don't quicken the pace of, of adoption and enabling their customers, people like me, to do more digitally, to do more without having to physically walk into a branch. Um, I think those are uh, things that excite and disappoint me. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think even with the disappointments, uh, they're sure trying. They're just, they're, I, I think I heard that you're disappointed not with them in operation, but much rather the speed or the lack yeah. of the acceleration. Yep. So, and I think uh, that is where fintechs have stepped in, right? To, to basically uh, fill that void. You know, that's where digital banks are, are cropping up and, and filling that void. And uh, other companies that uh, super apps, you know, that uh, that are consumer facing, but aggregate all of these financial uh, services for the consumer. I think if I were a bank, a traditional bank, I would I would be nervous about losing the eyeballs of my customer. Yeah, especially when you provide a product that is uh, sparking joy, so to say, when you use yeah. it instead of being cumbersome and making you all not this thing again, right? Exactly, uh, yes. However, however, in terms of, it, it's always been an interesting discussion across any panels or interviews, one, one that we had that on one hand side, you have this expectation uh, specifically for people who have had this experience with the bank where the physicality of it all was just like when back in the old days, if I might say that, 27 years of age uh you were very used that if a brand appeared on tv immediately a legit brand in the eyes of the audience likewise here if there's a physical bank there's a place that you know that you can go to that there's human customer service so reassuring yeah. when you get someone the gift of trusting them with your money assets everything considering finance and on the other hand, we have a whole generation up and coming of people who, in order to have their first banking experience, never had to do anything else than App Store. Let's go with maybe Revolut and done. More right? than that, so, you have people who will buy something because Kim Kardashian said so, right? So <laughs> talk about <laughs> brand trust and, and what it means to, to influence. That That's a totally different uh yeah story than it was 20 years ago yeah yeah, yeah. uh I'm not sure if you saw the news about the marilyn monroe dress but i have I seen it what, yeah <laughs> what, a, what a sad piece of news but back to product management uh yeah. is there yeah. anything that drives you nuts in product management something that is considered in incumbent behavior in product management so is um Things that upset me, well, maybe there's two things. First of all, when a product team jumps to the solution before they validated the problem, because sometimes you have a piece of technology in front of you that can seemingly solve the problem. But if you've not gone and validated the problem, you can't really know for sure that you're solving the right thing, answering the right question. Um, and, uh, and, and I think maybe on the same theme, just being in love with technology rather than thinking about the customer. Because again, technology 
speeds up so quickly and there's so many ways in which you can do something build something so many cool functionality you can put out there um but losing sight of the customer and the needs of the customer i think is uh, a recipe for disaster and a recipe for not um building a long-term scalable product yeah, I suppose it's for form over function, right? It's exactly. something that you have to avoid because the more you love something, the more you become passionate to the point yeah. where some others might not be as passionate about this tiny thing. So always, always remember that uh, even though you might like some functionality, uh, developing products for yourself is uh, sometimes as ineffective as it is selfish, right? So... Um, that that works for me as an answer uh and in terms of tips uh just recently we had a live stream with our head of the qa department and we were discussing uh engineering culture what it is how do you recognize a good one how do you recognize a bad one red flags green flags the entire rainbow uh is there product culture that exists in symbiosis in opposition to engineering mm -hmm. culture, coexistence, what is it? Absolutely. So in my mind, you know, I, obviously there, I'm sure there's all kinds of flavors out there, but definitely where the companies that I enjoy working in, uh, the environment I enjoy working in is one of symbiosis, not symbiosis maybe, but, uh, you know, we like to call it uh, N in a box, N being some number, could be three in a box where it's product design and engineering, could be sometimes, you know, four with project management, it depends, different. I, I am not a purist, whatever works for you is what you should be, you know, doing as a framework. Uh, but for me, there, what I love when I work with software engineers is, um, finding the right level of tension between uh, challenging them um, in terms of challenging them to think about function, you know, this is what needs to happen for the customer, and then them challenging me or us, the product managers, about technology. For example, if we don't invest in that technology, we're going to lose performance. We're going to lose speed or ability to scale right uh because uh for me I'm, I'm not a technical person i do not have technical background and most of the and i don't think i know that again there's different approaches but in my opinion a good product manager doesn't necessarily need to have a technical background if they have good engineering partners who can uh who can who can have their back on that side so i definitely love working with engineers who come in and say we need to invest 20% of our capacity in this quarter, in this upgrade, for example, because it's going to help us perform better on this function, because that helps me connect it to the customer experience. That helps me say, this is how end to end, uh, everything, um, everything comes together for, to a good experience, for a good experience to our customers. I had a conversation this morning with DevOps engineers uh, and they said to me, we feel sometimes like we're in the background. We're just about deploying things. And we're just, you know, we're about AWS and, you know, we're not customer facing. And my answer to them was, if you, even if you are not customer facing, everything that you're doing can be directly correlated with something that a customer is experiencing. And that's, that's how we work together as a team. That's how we set ourselves up for success. Okay. So now if I may uh, challenge you with a follow-up question, I think sure. it's in my experience at least. So once again, tell me if my experience is not representative of the entire yeah. sample. You have many more, uh, many more years of experience here because you said you don't need to have a technical slash engineering background when you have great engineering partners. Uh, so the intent to help, I'm pretty sure 99% of the time is there. What do you think is, is missing? Do engineers, they, it, because uh, hearing what you just said, I think you should be considering yourself extremely lucky because in many situations, mm -hmm. it is the case that product managers find themselves needing to have some experience because 
the engineering partners are rarely empowered enough, feel allowed enough. What do you think is to, to blame, quote unquote, for the engineering partner being invited to the table or feeling invited to the table to the point where they know that they are the expert and they can help someone execute their job better instead of being considered, why are you meddling with this or that? Right, yeah. So I think we're touching on a question of culture and leadership. Uh, and, and yes, every company is going to be different. And even, you know, companies that I've worked with had gone through transition of, of culture where maybe this, we started out a certain way and we made the journey to, to make changes and adapt to, to a different way of working. Um, I, I think, it, first of all, it starts with the vision of whoever is uh, leading uh, product, technology, the company. And if you're lucky enough to work for leaders who value that sort of uh, collaboration. So, you know, I, for example, report into the chief product officer, but there's a CTO also. Uh, and if they have a good, um, if they share uh, a culture of, of uh, collaboration, then they will filter it down to their teams, right? And they will make that expectations on their teams as well. And, and that's how I, the way I treat it is because I view that collaboration as critical that's the expectation I set for my team is, you know, product manager owns the why, the engineer owns the how, and they need to come together um, and, and find uh, the best way to build a product that delivers that value for the customer. In the end, it's for the customer. It's not for the product manager or for the engineer. There's a there's objective and a result that we're looking for, and we're all accountable to it. So I know it might sound a little bit fluffy, but uh, that I think that's what drives uh, the right culture uh, and also accountability. Because when someone's not empowered, they can also hide behind you know those who are quote unquote empowered, right? So an unempowered engineer can also sit back and go like, that's not my problem. You know, if we didn't deliver that, that's his problem or her problem because they're 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 up front. They're the ones who are telling me what to do. Right. Whereas if it's teams working together, everyone is accountable to each other. But hopefully that's just the one percent of this not so great intent mixed with some apathy of, you, you know, you're the boss. You told us to do so. Yeah. So why would I question you? And then you've got, we're, uh, we're human beings. Right. And, and we are constantly evolving and we're constantly driven to improve even if we're not successful, that's our drive. <laughs> so hopefully we find ourselves in an environment that is generating positive momentum. And, and if not, maybe we need to think about whether we're in the right place or not. Okay. So now some, 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 uh, but I gotta say this wasn't fluff at all. I love the fact that the product <laughs> manager, the, the why the engineer owns the how and the customer owns the yes please more of that <laughs> exactly right? um, so uh i got a couple questions we got 10 minutes plus so definitely going to squeeze that in i am curious to hear your opinion on the following uh and this might be slightly linked to what we're seeing in in, in the markets what we've seen as a result of uh everybody being allowed to give it a shot uh just trying to see if they can grow as fast as possible there are also local solutions and i'm talking about payments here uh so mm -hmm. for example in poland we have we have bleak in, in the netherlands there's ideal uh a lot of solutions that are uh local uh perhaps solving a specific payment trail or account to account there's Apple Pay, there's Google Pay, there's crypto that you mentioned. So from the customer perspective, knowing that there is no way for all of these to survive in the long run, let's say that once again, I haven't turned on the news today. I don't see what's happening in the market. There is no way for me to go on Crunchbase and see that there are 111 buy now, pay later companies. <laughs> there's no space enough in this city for 111 buy now, pay later companies. So dumbing it down from buy now pay later just payments in general what feature sets or what are like the basic three things in order to be the preferred payment method you know or much much harsher sounding in order to ensure your survival right mm. yeah 
I think, so you mentioned buy now, pay later, and we can talk about that. You're right. Uh, we've had an exponential growth in buy now, pay later, right? And now we're seeing some of these companies uh, maybe not not as uh, as sound uh, a foundation as as um, as we thought they had, and some of them are having difficulties. So overall, it validates that buy now, pay later is something that consumers like. I, I don't think that's actually great news. I mean, we've had credit cards, which is a sort of buy now, pay later type, you know, uh, payment method, and and these companies came in and they slightly tweaked the model to say, yeah, well, you can buy now, pay later without actually paying interest. So that's, you know, for consumers, that that is that is something that consumers like, definitely um, consumers who are cash strapped. So it's a certain generational uh, uh, segment that is attracted to these um, types of models. But the fact that you understand the need in the market i mean if, if anything from this conversation you can learn is doesn't mean you're going to be successful it doesn't mean you built it in the right way uh it doesn't mean that your foundation is good enough that you know how to manage the risk of buy now pay later that you know how to attract businesses who would want to use your buy now pay later uh solution versus someone else's and so I think the success of a product is all of these things. Yes, understanding the problem in the market and, and what needs to be solved is number one. Absolutely. Being successful about it is everything else, is how you do product management. That's the magic of, of building a business and, and, and building the right product. Um, and so, again, connecting with a theme we spoke about earlier, knowing what the trend is, knowing that people will always seek to uh, postpone <laughs> maybe uh, a payment if they can, right? That is, that is an important understanding of, of, uh, of consumer behavior. Um, and then building a product that is the right experience for the consumer, the right experience for the business, that is accepting that payment, that's and building a, a sound business, you know, that's that's the that's the um, that's what's going to determine failure from success. And as always in the market, there's going to be a conflation. There's going to be an explosion of many many actors out there, and those who are really successful might swallow up some of those uh, smaller ones. So we're going to see some acquisition and some coming together of of uh, different companies. Um, and also maybe we'll see a behavioral shift, maybe, maybe with higher interest rates, maybe, you know, it'll be harder to, um, to operate a buy now, pay later business. And we'll see maybe a contraction in that category until the cycle, you know, renews itself and, and uh, suddenly credit businesses are appealing again. Uh, I think that's actually what's fascinating about payments in general. It's, always evolving it's not just about technology it's about micro and macro trends in countries in the world in um in in technology so i i think if you ask me again what what takes what what gets me out of bed in the morning those are those are the interesting things that that i like to uh, think about Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm enjoying the fact that we're returning to that question time and time again. And and I, I agree. I mean, on one hand side, the crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So we're probably going to see many people figuring out the current constraints that are being placed on them. Uh, I've heard so, some rumors that uh, funds like, uh, for example, Sequoia are still doing deals, perhaps at more... Um, uh, perceptive terms than previously, uh, uh, so this is just going to be a dry run for for uh, funds and startups alike that simply were not able to uh, to 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 pass the tests uh, because uh, we're no longer in the game of we will figure out the margins later. Just make sure you have the market share, but much yeah. rather uh, oh, oh it, it, does this make sense as a business, right? So. Um, you know, uh, I have some questions concerning product management. I have some audience questions concerning revenue, profitability in the market. Which way would you like me to take this conversation? Mm, it's your show. Go for it. It's, it's our show. It's our show. The minute <laughs> you enter, this, it's our show. So, okay, let's let's do split seats. Uh, so uh, we got from Radek. 
And the question of Radek, we will see it on the screen in a moment, mentioned at 40 billion, uh, a potential for an IPO. And this means that you can expect to make over 1 billion in profits each year to be more or less comparable to profitability. What level of revenue are you expecting in the time? Without breaking any NDAs, these are questions that you <laughs> uh to be honest i wouldn't even be able to tell you and like we actually we said that too maybe 20 30 minutes ago five years to me in in this environment is crazy crazy long uh i i i i'll quote again guillaume our founder when he says to us that we're in chapter zero i fully uh i embrace that because i know our market i know that uh you know the, the digital payment space is still what i think less than 15 percent of of global payments in general so that's the white space to cover right and um and and i think at least for me i'm a strong believer in technology and and a strong believer in um in in the scalability of of uh of of the payments uh, space. So I see, you know, a lot of opportunity. What I like about checkout versus maybe other uh, companies is our approach to, uh, to technology and, and to solutioning through technology um, allows us to move very fast and, uh, and to be very focused. And so, you know, I, I really honestly, it's not, I'm not even trying to, I'm not avoiding the question. I really don't know what five years from now looks like. I, I know what's on the roadmap for us in like the next two, three years, and I'm very excited about it. Um, and, uh, and and I think there's a lot of opportunity. Um, just before I forget, uh, and I'm actually on the brink of forgetting, but when you mentioned <laughs> the behavioral changes in payments, one interesting thing is that you would imagine that trusts right now would be slightly higher, even in terms of, you know, even if I send the transfer some wrong way, you know, I can probably get it back. Whilst right now we are down to the very second, the confirmation of the payment, we can send a gift along with the payment. Right. Whilst way back, we used to hand out checks for people to cash out. And at that moment, that could be the end of our knowledge, what happened, when it happened, where it was cashed out, unless we entered an actual branch. So it's interesting to see this paradox. We, we developed so many ways to, for payments better now because back then we just didn't need to, we didn't need to, we need to, to do that. Um, exactly. And that leads to my, to my last question. Uh, that is in terms of uh, when we have companies like the world coin so it's a big person at this point uh we are looking at humans as a method of authorization payments right so that must also be exciting when i'm going to ask you about biometrics ai processes that allow humans to be the carriers of embedded payments in some sense right so What's what's your take on that? Do you think it's a, it's a gimmick? Do you think it's something that actually has a chance? But I'm asking you once five year horizon question, and that's yeah. wrong. I I think it's inevitable. Uh, first of all, we're already seeing it, right? We're already using our uh, either our face or our thumbprint or you know our fingerprint to to authenticate ourselves on our on our devices uh, for payments and otherwise. Uh, I, I, I was in uh, New York a few months ago and I walked into the Amazon store, you know, pay with my, my palm print. Um, and yeah. those are, those are all like, uh, I, I think great experiences because at the end of the day, the only unique thing that we have is ourselves. And so if you're going to need to authenticate yourself, do it with, you know, something that only you are, which is you. I also think if you ask me longer, longer term, you know, here's a prediction that um, yeah. biotechnology is going to be a thing. So we will have technology in our bodies, right? So it won't just be my fingerprint. It will be something else that is not biological, maybe, uh, in my opinion, um, somewhere on me that will allow me to interact with the world, whether it's payments or otherwise. So 
I think I think uh, long term uh, it's inevitable and and probably not a bad thing. You know, it's dangerous. It's frightening. It's it's there's a lot of risk in it, but. So, so was, as you say, digital payment a few years ago, right? Uh, check seemed secure. Yeah. Check seemed like a physical thing you're holding in your hand and you know this is your money versus it being somewhere in the cloud. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we as uh, humankind will be able to, to figure this out one way or the other. Let's grant mm -hmm. ourselves some leniency in terms of making mistakes. It's actually interesting what you mentioned, uh, the face ID or the touch ID with the face ID. There's a technical limitation of up to 10,000 faces that it can uh, sort of be able to tell apart. And that's where mm -hmm. WorldCoin's sort of connection between the iris and everything else just uh -huh. comes into this is you for sure. And there is no statistical doubt about that. And that just can't be mistaken. So the last question that's completely nothing to do with tech, it's more to do with you. I'm handing you a magic wand and you cast a spell. And that spell allows every 12 year old in the world to be gifted the education on, on what? And there's no right answer. There's just your answer. Um, I'm actually going to go nothing technology. I'm going to go with tolerance. I think, uh, yeah. I think as, as humankind, uh, we can all benefit from a bit more tolerance, a bit more open-mindedness about, uh, others, other people's beliefs, other people's behaviors, uh, and how to, uh, coexist. In the end, I think that will also drive better technology and better because it, it will drive more collaboration and, and uh, seeing uh, problems through different lenses. Um, but yeah, I, I do wish that uh, if, if I could, if I could um, wish that on, on 12 year olds or any other age person, I think I would do that. <laughs> and we assume that after the abracadabra, the tender age of 12, you know, stays with them further on. It so doesn't, yeah, that it lasts. <laughs> I mean, uh, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. So here to the tune of the popular song, just try a little tenderness, I suppose, is, is the magical nice. spell. <laughs> yeah. uh, overall, that concludes today's episode. So yeah, thank you so much, dear audience. Thank you so much. And uh, our executive production team, thank you just as much. And uh, see you next Tuesday, as always, on the next episode of Disruption Talks. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Bye. Pleasure is ours. Bye-bye.